Amen. Guys, if I haven't been introduced to you yet, my name is Rose, and it's fantastic to be here with you, finishing out this final part of our Being Human series. I'm excited to round this out. We've got a brand new series starting next week, but we're going to close out Being Human for today. And in this series, we've been talking about some of the common ground that we all share as human beings, some of the things that unite us, some of the things that connect us all together. But I'm going to start by telling you a story of my own foolishness. So, you know, hopefully that also makes you feel better. Um, Dan, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Uh, I want to just kick off today and kick off this message with just a little bit of advice for you. You know, we've got the holidays coming up, big time of year for lots of us. Maybe you're already, maybe you're a planner. Maybe you're already thinking ahead to Christmas and what it is that you need to do. I have four kids, so I'm already thinking a little bit in that mindset of what do we need to get? What do we need to have in place? And I just wanted to share a story from a couple of years ago in my life of what I decided to do on Christmas, just so you can not make the same mistake that I have made um, in, this, in this particular decision. Now, I decided one of the gifts that I wanted to get my kids was an organizational piece of furniture. Ooh, doesn't that sound exciting? Um, amazingly, my children found it exciting. But I decided that I was going to take on the mammoth task of basically sorting out some of my kids' toys because maybe sometimes we don't need to get new things. We just need to rearrange what they already have. The problem was that I decided to do this on Christmas Eve, um, which is just a terrible, terrible life decision on my part. So I put together these drawers, and on Christmas Eve, I decided to take their bucket of Legos and just start splitting them into colors so that they could use them so that they could build things. I thought this was a great idea. I'd stick on a Christmas movie, and that's how I would spend my Christmas Eve. Guys, it took me forever. It took forever. It took such a long time. But we made it. We got there. We got some color-coordinated Legos for the team to rebuild some things. And the reason why uh, that was a gift to them, the reason why that was a joy to them, is because they wanted to build something. I feel like the reason why Legos is a, a company, is a whole brand, the brand of Lego, the reason why they've done so well is because it taps into something within us. We want to build something. We want to do something that matters. We want to put our hands to things that are going to be fruitful. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. This human desire that actually we all share, whether you've considered it or not, that we want to use our time and our energy to make a difference. We want to do something that is going to last. And in kids, maybe that looks like construction. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe you were not a Legos kid, but maybe you're creative. Maybe you couldn't help but turn your hand to creating things or writing music. Maybe you're helpful and practical and organization is something that just brings you alive. Maybe you wanted to practically make a difference by turning your hand to something and having something to show for it at the end. Maybe you're an ideas person and you come alive or you're kept up at night with the way that things could be improved, the ideas that would change this world. We want to build things. As human beings, we all want to build things. And I, we've been talking through this series to take you back to where it all started. We've been talking about this quote that says that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're actually spiritual beings having our human experience right now. This, this short time frame on this earth, this is just our human experience. But within each one of us is a spiritual design and a spiritual call, which actually shapes everything that we do. It shapes our motivation. It shapes our, what it is that we're looking to get out of life. It shapes our priorities. We are spiritual beings called and created by God, whether or not we have realized that. And he is designing something within us. So I want to talk about something that I think is going to split the room today. So apologies in advance. You might agree with me. You might disagree with me. But I want to talk today about the fact that we were actually created to work. We were created to work. And for some of us, that immediately sounds awful because we do not love what we do on a Monday to Friday, nine to five. I'm not necessarily talking about employment, okay? And I think that's an important distinction to make from the beginning. I'm not necessarily talking about you were created to go sit behind your desk and answer emails. I'm not necessarily talking about you were created to put on your uniform and go represent your company in your workplace. That's not what I mean. 
in the world that we live in, which has become so much about work, then that's immediately what our mind can jump to. And I understand that. We, we all have a job. We all do something to pay the bills. We all spend our time doing something. Maybe you're somebody who goes out to work with someone else. Maybe you run your own business. Maybe work for you right now looks like caring for someone else. Maybe you're raising children. Maybe you're caring for loved ones. Maybe you're building community in some other way. But I want to suggest to us today as we finish out this series that we were actually created with a desire to use our energies to make a difference to the world that we're in. So let me just tell you what I mean by work so we don't get confused. Here's the definition. It's just engaging physically or mentally in a physical or mental activity to achieve a purpose or a result. Guys, I don't know if we, uh, you know, necessarily woke up this morning thinking about this, but you are brought alive when you have purpose, when there's a result within your reach, where there's something that you can see ahead of you that you might be able to participate in physically, mentally, that's actually going to bring about some reward. We were created with a desire deeply inbuilt inside of us to be fruitful. We want to be people who don't waste our time, who don't lounge around. We're actually, we want to be people who make a difference. It's a deep desire within every one of us. And so I'm calling that work. And if work for you means something else, just come with me on this journey, okay? Come with me, stay with me about the fact that we were created to make a difference. We were created by God to be fruitful people, to put our hands on things and see the situation change, see something come about that wasn't there before. So that's what we're talking about today is the fact that you and I, we were created for work. And you might think that does not sound like a good reason to be created. That does not sound like a good time, God. You know, our world today is very heavy on the work pressure. I read somewhere this week as I was researching for this that we on average will spend 90,000 hours working in our lifetime. That's a lot of time. That's the majority probably for most of us of our time that we will spend thousands of hours in work. And we might be tempted to think off the back of that stat that you know what we really need is we need a break. <laughs> we need less work. We need, to, uh, we need to take some time off. But the truth is that for people who don't have purpose, who aren't a part of something that is seeing result, it's actually a really discouraging and demoralizing way to live in the long term. Now, we all love a break, but in the long term, if we're not putting our hands to something that's actually fruitful and changing things, we get discouraged, we get down in that environment. And this is the reason why. It's because God actually created us to be a part of producing fruit, making a difference. Let's go right back to the beginning in Genesis. This is what it says in Genesis 2. It says, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it because there's something within us that wants to sow seed and see fruit grow. There's something within us that wants to take a bare patch of land and produce onto that land something that's of importance, something that's of significance. So right at the beginning, when mankind was created, what did God do with us and for us? He said, go be fruitful, go produce something, go and tend and care for a garden, because you in doing so will glorify me and you'll feel fulfilled in that action. This is what he goes on to say when he's created man and woman together. He says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Go do something. It's so interesting to me that God did not create mankind and then say, now your job is just to love me. Just love me 24-7, 365. That is a part of our purpose, and we are here to glorify God. But he gave us a task in glorifying him. He actually gave something for our hands to do. Isn't that so interesting? He also doesn't say, go love one another. Make that the whole job. Just love one another, love one another. He gives us a practical way to do that. Let's go provide for one another. Let's go grow some vegetables that are going to feed one another. Let's go see this earth flourish in a way that will bless one another. God gives work to our hands, and we are created to make a difference. We're created to fulfill something. So if that desire is there in us in kids... You know, we want to go build something, create something, make something, make a den, make a whatever it is, go to the beach and dig a big hole. We want to do something, right? 
right from the beginning. If that desire is within us, then where do we see it in the Bible? And what is it that we're now called to do with that desire? What are we supposed to be doing? Because I don't know about you, but I don't play a lot of Legos anymore. That's not necessarily where my focus is, but I want to still make a difference. I want to be somebody who's having an impact on this earth. Let's take a look at the Bible and take a look at a few examples where God commissioned people to go build something. He actually charged them with a task that was practically engaging in work for a purpose. You know, the first one that came to mind for me is right at the beginning of the Bible. So we've, we've seen Genesis and how God placed Adam and Eve in this garden to work it. But very shortly after that, God charged Noah with this commission to build an ark. And he, he speaks to Noah and he says, I want you to do this for me. Would you go and take part in this activity for me? Would you go and unleash this action for me? Because it's going to have impact on the world around you. What about this in the Old Testament? He asked Solomon to build a temple. He charged Solomon with the task of using his hands, getting out there and building, constructing this place where his glory would be present, where people could go and meet with him. Nehemiah built a city wall, the city wall that was destroyed around Jerusalem. God said to him, go and make it right. Go and use your hands and build something up. You know, when we're listening to God, he will often charge us with some kind of action to go do. And all of these things are things that God asked of mankind to save them, to lead them to himself. You know, the ark was there as a symbol of God's goodness, saying, I'm going to save those of you who are living right with me. The temple is a place where people could go and engage with God, where they could go and meet him. The wall was built around Jerusalem as this holy city, this place that symbolized God's presence, a place where people would take pilgrimages and go and pray and seek God for themselves. God usually asks us to partner with him in building something that's important to him. And so right through scripture, we see these examples of God saying, come build with me. Come build what I'm building. Come and be a part of building something that will actually save many, that will see people changed and saved for my glory. When we listen to God, he asks us to build with him. But what's interesting to me, and we're going to just take a look at a quick story right now, is that when he doesn't give us something to build, we still build. We can't help ourselves. We will build either way. We'll build what God is asking us to build, or we'll build by our own design. And I want to look at a story in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. You guys might have heard of this. We're just going to take a couple of verses from this story, and look at what happens when we build on our own. Let's look at what happens when we do the designing, when we do the commissioning. It says in Genesis 11, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and they settled there. They just found some, some open land. And you think these people, they could have camped in tents. They could have made some basic structures for themselves. But what do they do? It said They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. That's important. We're going to come back to that. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God didn't commission this build, but still in mankind, there is a desire to go and impact the landscape. There's a desire to go and see something done. Their interpretation of that call within them is there, but it's all in the wrong direction. And so what happens is they decide to build this tower. And I think somehow we can see a little bit of ourselves in some of this building. If we're not building the things that God has asked us to put our hands to, we can get caught up in building all the wrong things. Here's a few red flags for you if you want to just break down where these guys went wrong. First of all, they said, let us build ourselves a city. You know, we don't know where we should call home. We don't know maybe where we should be placing our feet. Let's decide it for ourselves. Let's build our own city. Let's decide that this place is our place. It goes on to say, let's build a tower that reaches to the heavens. You know, I think we all understand that there is something within us that desires elevation, 
There is something within us that desires that lifting up. And sometimes if we don't wait for God to lift us up, we'll try lift ourselves up. We'll try and do it in our own strength. We want to build our way to heaven. We want to earn our way to heaven, work our way to heaven, literally elevate ourselves up. It's a human desire that we get to see in such a stark form just here in this early civilization. Let's build ourselves a tower that reaches all the way to heaven because surely the highest I am, the more important I am. Surely the higher I'm lifted up, the better I'm succeeding in this life. There's a human desire within us to build something that elevates us. It said, let's do it so that we can make a name for ourselves because we want to be remembered. We want to be known. We want to build something for our glory. It's so easy when we consider this spiritual desire that we have to build something and make a difference and work and be fruitful, it's so easy to turn that towards our own glory. It's so easily done as human beings that we would start to desire to make a name for ourselves. And don't we see that all the time in the world around us? A generation hungry to make a name for themselves. Now, if that's what God has called you to do, if God's lifting you up, that's an incredible thing. But it should never be the motivation of our hearts to go, let's reach heaven. Let's build a name for ourselves. Let's create a city all our own. Let's do this in our own strength. And why are they doing this? It says, otherwise, we'd be scattered. We need each other. We got to stay together. We got to become this powerful force on the earth. We got to stay connected so that we don't get split up all over the place and maybe become weaker than we are as a unit. You know, there's a fear in here. There's a fear at the core of some of that human desire to build up and build strong. And these guys are spelling it out for us. We don't want to get scattered all over the face of the earth. But I just want to step back one second and also just point your attention to this. We're going to go uh, just a little deep dive for a moment into the history of building, if you will. I know you're excited. Um, they used brick instead of stone, and they used tar for mortar. This word tar it could be bitumen, it could be asphalt, okay? I know we're getting into uh, <laughs> some building site terms now. I don't know if you thought that we would talk about that today, but that asphalt is only mentioned three times in the whole Bible. And it's a really important substance because it's waterproof. And so the only other times that we hear about it is Moses' basket gets coated in it, but the ark gets covered in it. And God very specifically says to Noah, you've got to go and make some tar, and you've got to cover the outside of that boat because a flood is coming, and I want you to be protected. But after that flood, God makes a promise to mankind. He says, never again. I will never again flood the surface of the earth. But here are the people saying, just in case, just in case God's word wasn't true for us, just in case he changes his mind, just in case he doesn't want to save us, protect us, we need to back up our own tower here. We need to make sure we got an insurance policy. Let's mix up some tar. Let's coat the outside. Because God said, never again. But can we trust that? Or should we build for our own safety? Should we build for our own security? Should we just make sure that we're not going to fall short of anything that could maybe put us in danger? And so you just see this really interesting thing happen here where they're building this tower in all the wrong ways and for all the wrong reasons. Guys, that can happen to us. That can happen to us. This spiritual desire to build something can turn into an exposing of where we're not trusting, maybe where we're doubting the word of God. You had Noah building an ark, Solomon building a temple, Nehemiah building the walls, and you had a whole community of people building their own tower. We have a choice as to whether we're going to build with God or build for ourselves. And so I just want to make this statement or put this out there, just to get you to consider that the works of our hands can either show our devotion or our distrust. It can show the way that we are submitted to God or the way that we're doubting God. And I want to encourage you to just think about what you've been called to build right now. Maybe you have a job. Maybe you have a nine to five. Maybe you have something that God is uh, placing in front of you, an opportunity that you have to provide for your family or to save up for those luxuries, to get a good vacation. You know, there's lots of reasons why we do have to go out to work in this life. But when you look at that work, is it a way that you're expressing your devotion to God? Or is it actually a part of 
something that God wants to speak to you today about maybe a space where you're doubting God, that maybe you feel like he doesn't see you. He's not going to provide for you. You have to provide for yourself. Maybe a space where you realize that you're trying to maybe elevate yourself or make your own name rather than staying and letting God make a name for you. There are so many things that we get caught up in and we just feel like they're normal. We don't need to overanalyze them. But actually, what we build is so important. And I want to take a look at what we should be building, okay? So I don't think there's many of us today who are going to get a commission to build an ark. Maybe you will. Um, you can tell me about that afterwards in the cafe. But I don't think there's many of us right now who are necessarily called to step in and build walls and build temples. And maybe that's your day-to-day. -day. Maybe God's in that and, and he's working through that. But our, our call tends to look a little bit different now. It tends to look a little bit altered. So we have all of these Old Testament builders, and there's so many other examples that we could have used. But then we see Jesus come, and he's spoken about as the master builder, the master builder. Now, I know he was a carpenter, but I'm, I'm not seeing any scripture necessarily of a physical anything that he built with his own hands. We don't have the Jesus house or the Jesus palace or anything that he left to remind us of him. He's a master builder, and yet there's nothing that we can see that's a fruit of his ministry. So what was he building? What was Jesus building? What was his making a difference in the lives of people? Let's take a look at what it is that he started to do as a master builder. You know, one of the things that Jesus declared in his ministry is he said, I will tear down the temple and I will rebuild it in three days. That's some building. That's some building, but we don't have any scripture about him out there with his chisel and his mortar. It was a spiritual statement to say that I am going to take what the, the physical place that you have to go to meet with God, and I'm going to now embody that. I'm going to become the temple. And that's what we get to start giving our lives to building. We get to start giving our lives into building a meeting place for Christ to meet with us. That's what Jesus did. And once he had established himself as the master builder, he started to get his disciples alongside him. And they carried this kingdom message everywhere they went. You know, he said to them, I'm going to send you out in twos. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray for people. I want you to heal the sick. And I want you to proclaim that the kingdom is coming. It's not a kingdom of bricks and mortar. It's not a kingdom of streets. It's a kingdom that is the state of God being king of your heart. It is bringing heaven to earth. I'm going to start to ask you to partner with me in the most important building of all, says Christ. And it starts with the disciples, but this is what we see at the end of Christ's ministry on earth. We see the Great Commission. And guys, I'm sure some of you know this. It says in Matthew 28, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. There's this commissioned building that we are invited to take part in, and it doesn't look like bricks and mortar anymore. It doesn't look like the building site and the tar and the asphalt anymore, but it does look like a building call that's on every single one of us because we want to make a difference. We want to be fruitful people. We want to change the landscape that we're called to live in, but God says it no longer looks like raising a wall, raising a tower. Now it looks like stepping into people's lives and showing them them the way to Jesus. You know, it used to be an ark and a temple and a city that people would have to be in or on to know their salvation. But now it's a person. Now it's the person of Christ that people need to access to know their salvation. And it, the Bible says that not only was Jesus the temple being rebuilt, but every one of us is a temple of the Holy Spirit being able to be built up into the likeness of Christ. So what's the building work that's in our hands right now? It's changed some since the beginning of the Bible. But the building work in our hands is that we would be responsible for building up the temple of the Holy Spirit, our own lives, our own possibilities to pour the Holy Spirit out around us, and we would build up those around us so they would know how the Holy Spirit can live in them. That's the building work that we get to be called to now, is we get to be called to build the kingdom of heaven. 
We get to be called to build the kingdom of heaven. And every single one of you is created to do it. Every single one of you has a commission on your life to come partner with Christ and build the kingdom on earth. Now, I want to just ask you to consider this question. We're all pouring our time, our talent, and our treasure into something. What are we building? What are we building? Are we devoting the time that we have to building for Christ? Or are we building something for our own glory, for our own name, for our own advancement? You know, I know right now that I am talking to, uh, you know, accountants and full-time parents and teachers and firemen and nurses and people who are right now working in call centers and offices. And I don't know what your work looks like, but I guarantee you that God can use it for his job that he's inviting you to partake in, which is building up the kingdom. It doesn't matter what you do. It does not matter what your job is, what is currently paying the bills for you. What matters is why and how we look at doing that. So I want to just finish by taking you through four points that I want to encourage you in, four scriptures that maybe give us some some information, some grounding in this building work that we're called to. The first thing I want you to know is that what you build is important. What you build is important. If you're waiting for your forever career, if you're studying right now in anticipation of advancement in the future, you are not in the waiting zone. What you build right now is important because it doesn't matter what our job is. It doesn't matter what career path we're on or not on right now. It's actually about knowing that Christ has called us to build. This is what it says in Ephesians 2. It says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Every one of us has been prepared a path of work for Christ. Every one of us has been prepared something to do. What you do is important. And I don't mean a career fair, and I don't mean change jobs. I'm not in any way encouraging anybody right now to ditch the job and, you know, to, uh, to take it by faith. I'm not encouraging that necessarily, but I am saying that Christ has prepared something for you to do. And so when we consider those 90,000 hours of work time that we end up kind of caught in at different points in our life, I want to encourage you to be praying, God, today in my place of work, Today, in the operation, in the things that you've put in front of me, how can I build your kingdom? How can I step into this place that's paying my bills and take with me the Spirit of God? How can I build this living temple and other living temples around me? Because you've created something for me to do. And I promise you, if you start praying that, he will begin to answer. I want you to encourage that person. I want you to pray with that brother, with that sister who's going through a hard time. I want you to share your faith. When you get the opportunity in the break room, in the halfway through the day, use everything for Christ's glory and he will powerfully pour out through you. We were created to work, okay? This is not just the sideline. This is not the distraction from our Christian faith. It's not the time off where we kind of just flick into work mode and practical mode. It's a part of ministering God everywhere we go. What you build is important. Let's take a look at the next one, how you build is important. How you build. This is what it says in Matthew 6. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. How we build our lives and our time is so important. Don't build from fear. Don't work from fear, the the belief that maybe God is not going to meet your needs. He's not going to provide for you. He's not going to be able to, uh, to make sure that you have what you need to survive. We have to start with the right posture. That posture is trust. That posture is surrender to say, God, your will be done. Your kingdom come. And I trust that if I keep that in my sights first, everything else will fall into place, God. I trust that everything else will come when it needs to come. You'll pour it out on me when I need to receive it. How we build is so important. And so this morning, I want to just encourage you, examine your motivation. Examine, you know, your own posture towards work and what that looks and feels like for you right now. Don't do it out of fear, but do it out of a trust. And do it with the perspective that first of all comes your kingdom mandate on my life, God, and everything else will get added. Everything else will find its place. Why you build is important. The motivation. Colossians 3 says, whatever you do, 
Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you're serving. Why do we do it? Why do we get out of bed in the morning and show up at work? Why do we put a smile on our face and make the attempt to get there five minutes early? Why do we love the kids that God has placed in our lives? And why do we serve the communities that he's put us within to serve? Why do we do it? It's because it's the Lord that we're serving. In everything that we do, it's the Lord that we're serving. If you've in any way divorced your 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 work life from what it is that Jesus wants to do in you, I just want to encourage you to marry them back together today because God will use everything that you turn your hand to for his glory. But sometimes we just have to remind ourselves, it's Jesus I'm working for today. As I hit my classroom, it's Jesus I'm working for today. As I step into my office space, it's Jesus I'm working for today. I'm going to go and make his kingdom the highest priority in my life. But here's the final one, where you build is so important. If you've been a part of this series from the beginning, perhaps it has not escaped your attention that as we've talked through some of the different things that the human heart yearns for, we've also kind of tracked through a life. You know, we talked in the beginning about how we are created to belong and that desire grows within us right from birth, right from before birth, the desire to belong and be accepted and loved in a family. We talked about the desire to worship, and how I believe, you know, in that kind of adolescence, figuring out my identity, that's when we decide, what are we going to worship? What are we going to put our attention towards? What are we going to lift up in our own lives? And then last week, we talked about suffering. And I think there's something about the maturity of adulthood that holds suffering in a very specific way. But today, as we talk about building, I want to just take you for a moment and turn your attention to the fact that we are human beings having a spiritual experience. Um, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And that human experience is limited in its time. And one of the things that every single one of us in our human experience is guaranteed to encounter is the end of our life. And the spirit lives on. But here in our human form, we're not going to be here forever. We're building for somewhere far bigger and far greater than this patch of land that God's placed your feet on right now. We're building for something far beyond our 80, 90, 100 years on this earth. We're called to build in heavenly places because one day we will have the opportunity to return to them. And I want to encourage you to think about that for a moment because whilst nobody wants to come to church this morning and consider death, it is a part of our human experience. But our spirit lives on in Christ when we choose to make him the Lord of our lives, when we choose that he will be the one that we live for. When we make Jesus our savior, his promise is that you will join me in the kingdom of heaven. And guess what, guys? When we get there, we're going to work. We're going to work together. We're going to do things. We don't have time to go into that today, but we're going to be set on tasks that will once again be fruitful, that will change the landscape because it's a part of what we're created to do. But I just want to just read this scripture to finish. It says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, you want to have a fruitful life. You want to make a difference. It's all about setting your eyes on what Christ is calling you to and making that the number one priority in your life. It's all about daily surrendering to him and saying, God, what do you want me to work on today? Who do you want me to impact? Why have you set me here? What do you want me to see happen in this place, in the, around these people and in this community? We're building in heavenly places. And I would love to pray for us as we finish up today. Uh, so I'm going to invite you to just bow your heads where you are, where you sit. But I do want to draw your attention to something that I feel like God's really been drawing my attention to through this whole series, which is that this human experience that we spiritual beings get to have, it does have an end point. And one day, each one of us, we will depart this earth and we will go on for eternity. And we won't be able to take anything with us nothing that we've been working so hard towards right now. But when we make Christ our priority, when we make Jesus the most important thing, then he can store up treasures in heavenly places on our behalf. And I want to just give a moment for any one of you who's never really considered that before. 
never really considered that one day we're going to leave and Jesus invites us into eternal relationship with him. Jesus invites us into a place of living alongside him and spending eternity worshiping him. And he's so good to us that however we might feel like we fall short of that invitation, he says, I've paid the price. You don't have to worry about what you've done or where you're from. You don't have to worry about being good enough for my heavenly kingdom. All you have to do is you have to place your faith in me and make a decision to follow me for all your days. Amen. And God, I want to pray for every single one of us, God, to take today as an opportunity to switch our perspective towards our own fruitfulness. God, thank you that you made us fruitful. Thank you that you made us a people who desire to make a difference to the world around us and the world that we're yet to see. God, I pray you would make us a fruitful people. God, help us to see how and when and where to build. Lord, help us to keep your priorities at the forefront of our minds. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be those who would fall into the trap of building for our own glory, but we would continually set our eyes on you and build the things that you have called us to build in this life and the next.